Welcome to Business and Society. Our guest today is Robert Kolb, uh, Frank Considine Professor of Applied Ethics at Loyola University in Chicago, which happens to be my hometown. And also, uh, one of our guests, actually for today at least, is my Associate Director at the Ethics Center, uh, Dick Tengis who specializes in business ethics. And as we know, the title of our program today is The Financial Crisis, uh, What Went Wrong with Our Moral Compass? And so I really want us to focus on the ethical dimensions of this awful financial crisis we're suffering. And recently I was listening to the National Public Radio, actually it was on my way to Red Lobster on Sunday. And there's this series called Intellig oh, U.S. Intelligence Squared. I don't know why it's U.S. Intelligence Squared, where they do this Oxford-style debate on pressing issues of the day. And the pressing issue, and this is what I need to ask both of you about, but I'll start with our guest, uh, who's here for this conference uh, that Bell Co College is running, uh, was who's responsible for the financial crisis? Is it Washington? or is it New York? And then four people said it was Washington, and four people said it was New York. And they each, you know, had kind of, they each, although they were U.S. people, feigned a British accent, so they seemed to know what they were talking about. I'm curious, who do you think is most responsible? Well, I'll try to answer it without a British accent. Oh, no. You but can... I'd have to say that I agree with all eight of them. All eight of them. Uh, and also, there are some more parties that bear responsibility, too. But if, and if you want to focus on uh, Washington and New York, I think you have to tell a more complicated story about the responsibility of, of both parties, uh, starting first with Washington. Uh, it's long been public policy in the United States to foster and encourage home ownership. This goes back at least to the Depression. And if you look at the percentage of people living in their own homes over the 20th century and how that's grown up until, say, 2006, it's uh, increased remarkably. And a lot of that increase is due first to increasing wealth in the United States, but also to policies of the government that stimulated home ownership. So uh, this ranges from things like uh, the FH, FH mm -hmm. loan, sorry, the FHA loans, uh, but also the creation of Ginny Mae, Freddie Mac, uh, various kinds of tax breaks that are available only to homeowners mm -hmm. and so on. So that that really brought about a lot of it. But then also in Wall Street, of course, uh, a lot of the uh, incentives that were created and the processes that were instituted in terms of securitization uh, really bear a tremendous responsibility too. So there's plenty of blame to, to go around and do you uh, think, for all the parties. Do you think, and before I ask Dick, do you think uh, the regulators in Washington were doing their job? I mean, we, I think the best way to understand regulation is to think about people who are regulators as having their own interests and their own incentives, and that uh, plays into how the regulations are created and administered to a, a large extent. So in a way, maybe uh, they did what we as a society have been asking them to do. But obviously, it turned out that the regulation wasn't satisfactory. And when I say it that way, I don't mean that there wasn't enough regulation, which is something you hear very often today. But the, in many respects, there's perhaps too much, too little. A lot of it was too late, and most of it was too bad, in my view. So there's tremendous problems with regulation. I see. You know, Dick, I've, I've been meaning to ask you, given that, uh, for example, we don't have to worry about bonuses at UNC Charlotte as academics. We don't, we don't see bonuses. And of course, now, uh, given this fiscal crisis, we're not going to see any huge pay increases, if any. Uh, what do you think, and people are supposedly outraged right now about the executive compensation. Um, do you think uh, executives were being compensated too highly? Uh, what about these bonuses that were paid out to AIG? Um, I sometimes have questions in my mind. Uh, is it uh, worse for um, like industry executives to be getting huge bonuses while, hey, uh, people in like United Way get huge salaries and bonuses and perks? So we've had a lot of discussion about that here in Charlotte. Well, I'd, I'd like to start with the, the last one. 
the private one? I think in the uh, the charitable, the, yeah. the arts associations, the YMCA and so forth, I think that is different from the private sector, of course, but I think it's more of a difference in degree, not right. so much in kind. And, and what I mean by that is it's crystal clear in the arts council mm -hmm. that everybody's giving their money, everybody's cooperating, and so everybody is a direct stakeholder and they want to be sure that everything is is being fair and then if if a CEO or, or you know the leader of that takes an exorbitant salary everyone says unfair because fairness in the cooperation system is crystal clear as a, as a goal and the and the cooperation is palpable well <clears throat> I think it's harder to see but the financial system itself is a cooperative system and so what what's a little harder to see is similar ideas of fairness from all of those who are cooperating again not directly by giving your dollars to the arts association but less directly by working for a corporation by cooperating with the laws by uh, by being a good citizen, by being a responsible person, and all, all of that is a kind of cooperative scheme as well. Now, if, if some people walk off with what seems to be an unreasonable amount of money, uh, it's not envy, it's a sense of unfairness that many people feel. And I don't think, um, I think we run a risk of simply allowing everyone to make what they can get, as it were, without somehow systematizing some kind of uh, fairness uh, factor. Well, you know, I, this is something I'd like to focus on just as a spin-off from your comment. Um, in the U.S., we always have a notion of lower limits, like a point under which people shouldn't go, where we kind of come up with some programs like Medicaid or whatever, all right. But in a sense of upper limits, have we really had a notion of upper limits, a point above which people should not be rewarded, people shouldn't get compensation, or is that simply um, undemocratic or against freedom? You know, that, that, the, the argument here right now with the executive pay is that if you don't let the, uh, that be sky high and you don't um, let uh, there be the huge bonuses, there won't be adequate incentive to do the work. Do you think that's true? What you, you said uh, is perhaps und undemocratic and against freedom. Yeah. But perhaps that's it's against freedom but uh, consonant with democracy. Explain. Uh, well, in the sense that it's against freedom and uh, prohibiting people from doing the best that they can for themselves, but democratic in the sense of leveling and making people more equal. Um, so why should there be an upper limit? Uh, or should there be? I, I think there should not be. And it, but in a way, we do uh, impose limits of a sort by handicapping people in terms of how much they can make because we have a fairly high Taxes. marginal tax rates that apply to to larger and larger incomes. And we have a state tax that confiscates large fortunes, or at least not the entire fortune, but are very high, what right. I believe about 50% right. at the margin. So in a way, we, we do take from people who do very well in our society, but we don't take everything. And presumably the reason for that is uh, that we want to allow them some freedom to continue to do well for themselves, and we want to encourage them to bring their talents to bear for the benefit of society as a whole. All right, so um, just going along that thought or whatever, as I understand it, uh, CEOs in many European nations, and that, that's as far as I want to go, are compensated um, less than our own. Um, what culture has prompted that being the case? In other words, as I understand it, executives in Germany or France or whatever don't make nearly as much as, like, say, executives did or might continue to in the United States. Uh, that's certainly true, as a matter of fact. Uh, mm -hmm. Compensation levels at the top uh, for corporations in the U.S. have been much higher than abroad. Uh, but it hasn't always been that way. Really? For instance, in 1990, a famous article was written uh, about uh, 
CEO compensation. And it said that CEOs were basically paid like bureaucrats. In other words, they got a salary that was cushy and mm -hmm. ample, a high salary, but it wasn't super high in right. the way we've come to experience since. And the criticism of this was that it didn't give uh, these executives the incentives to make the company prosper as fully as it could. Instead, it gave them incentives to enjoy this high salary and to have a nice, quiet, kind of lazy life <laughs> and to, uh, uh, to consume uh, perquisites. Uh, they, so, they were rich, but not, not so, yeah. But, right. right, and uh, so the whole idea was to give them a stake in the, in the company, and that's the incentive compensation part, conducted largely through stock options, but also through bonuses, with the idea being that if you made their payoffs more like those of the company, then they would be motivated to really make the company prosper, which of course would help the shareholders and the employees and so on too. So there's a kind of rationale behind that. Right, right. Well, you know, just kind of changing the topic slightly, um, Dick, you know, we were supposedly the bailout nation now, mm -hmm. all right. <laughs> and also as people are getting bailed out, we know right now the focus is on the car, um, I should say automobile industry, I still call them cars, but the automobile industry and how much, you know, everybody is losing count of how many billion or trillion have been given already. And then a lot of, you know, the, the man on the street, the woman on the street is saying, why don't they bail me out too? You know, why don't I get bailed out? And do you think the right people are getting bailed out? Well, <laughs> yes and no. Yes. I mean, it, it looks to me like uh, in an emergency situation, we're going to have to, I think the Obama administration talks this way, we're going to have to look not so much at, at ideals of fairness and, and just desserts and so forth, but uh, at the end product, <laughs> we need to get this mess Salvaged, moving yeah. again. And uh, like in many crisis situations, I think uh, the correct thing to do is to get those, get that job done, and uh, try to to honor other principles like like fairness or or justice or something. But but we need efficiency now, I think, more than anything. So in that sense, the answer to who should be bailed out, and I think you can distinguish probably between the banks and General Motors in this way. You know, probably, I'm thinking the banks probably need to be bailed out for the greater good, you might say, oh, whereas perhaps GM uh, maybe doesn't need to be bailed well, out. There are other, other automobile manufacturers. Bob, what do you think about that? Well, first of all, I think there's a question is uh, in identifying who's actually getting bailed out. Yeah, why not? Uh, yeah. I keep hearing that, well, Wall Street's getting bailed out. Right. Uh, well, some parties in Wall Street maybe are getting bailed out, but maybe not the ones you think. So, for instance, if you think of a company like Citicorp, mm -hmm. uh, had a stock price not too long ago of, I think, about $90, mm -hmm. uh, whereas now it uh, is down to about $2.50. So I think it's fair to say that the shareholders well, are not getting, getting bailed, bailed out so well. Yet I think most people in our society think, oh, the owners of these companies are getting bailed out. And that's not the case, no. necessarily. Uh, some of the counterparties have been bailed out in the sense that, for instance, we gave AIG money and they passed that money on to fully honor their contracts to other large institutions such as themselves, Goldman Sachs and so on. Right, and also a lot of European banks. I saw the Deutsche Bank and... Right, yeah, there's, su there's suddenly a realization that much of this money has flowed to overseas institutions right. and people seem scandalized uh, yeah. at this, but yeah. I, I find it an amazing naivete that people can be a realize, astounded yeah. and, and scandalized <clears throat> because we gave them that money or the administration gave them that money so that they could honor their commitments. And then I think also, and this is part of what uh, I think is Dick was getting at, there's a tremendous problem of undeserving beneficiaries in all of this, mm -hmm. right? So we give money to AIG and uh, <laughs> Goldman Sachs benefits from that because they get paid off. Right. But we didn't necessarily do it in order to bail out Goldman Sachs mm -hmm. or because Goldman Sachs uh, deserved it. We bailed out AIG and thus uh, Goldman Sachs to some extent and others uh, to preserve the financial system. And I think that's the idea of efficiency that Dick is talking about. Yeah. And, and in this effort to save the system, which really is important to all of us, 
uh, a lot of that money will inevitably go to people who are really undeserving in some way. Right, you know, um, just yesterday, to be honest, I was reading a, a simple article in Time or Newsweek or whatever that was explaining AIG and where the money was going and pointed out how much of the percentage of life insurance that AIG has basically controlled the markets for, and I was wondering, hey, is UNC Charlotte's you know, <laughs> life insurance part of AIG or not, or whatever? And then I realized um, what they said was basically, you know, and if there was not AIG, people would be cashing out their life insurance policies and so on and so forth, create this incredible destabilization. You suddenly realize the importance of maintaining you know, some of these huge financial centers. Uh, I'm happy they're, you know, being maintained or whatever. It's, it's very scary. I liked what you said about who's being bailed out. Yeah, the shareholders. And in a way, I feel myself as depending upon who owns whichever policy I've purchased, you know what I mean? My neck is being saved, too, in, in a very real way. Right, and, and I think, you know, a modern economy uh, yeah. has to have a functioning financial system or the whole uh, the whole society will collapse. Well, and it's the global implications that scare me too, to be honest, and the, the current kind of emergence of new centers of power um, and what that's going to mean for the U.S. and what's that going to mean for the rest of the world and all of that. It might lead to a more equitable state of affairs worldwide, and then again it might lead to all sorts of uh, financial disruptions and who knows what. Um, I keep thinking about the marriage of Fiat and Chrysler, for example, yeah. and, and what the baby will, <laughs> will, will quite look like. Um, but anyway, Dick, you know, um, I was actually listening to Bob on a, on a competing media event this morning, a radio event, though, in town, and the uh, topic of um, ethics and business ethics education came up. And actually, the uh, topic of the conference that's being uh, sponsored by Bell College and, and the Ethics Center and so on is, uh, let me see if I remember, business ethics and the credit, credit crisis, crisis or whatever. Yes. And the notion was that, well, maybe if people had been more ethical or had that as part of their fiber, uh, this wouldn't have happened or, or some of it wouldn't have happened. What do you think? Well, <laughs> Uh, you can't do too much with a standalone business ethics course, you know, in the yeah. senior year of management school. Or, or you can do something in a business ethics class. I think you can teach the students to be a little more aware of the consequences of actions, uh, things that they might not have been aware of. But uh, honestly, what I what I worry about more is um, some of the you might say the philosophy of human nature maybe or the philosophy of e economics maybe that's that's sort of in the culture of the business school curriculum itself i mean i'm sure this is changing some but but uh, the, the idea that every every individual person is a rational utility maximizer and is governed by almost uh, Newtonian-like laws of inertia to seek their own gain and let this law uh, work out in the end. I'm afraid some of these kids pick up that idea <laughs> and, and, uh, and don't have a broader sense of who they are and how their efforts fit into this larger system. And so they uh, per, you know, this is a fiction in my mind. I'm sure they run off to, to Wall Street to make a million dollars for themselves without sort of thinking, well, what about the next quarter or the quarter after that? Or, you know, are these assets uh, healthy or toxic or, or what? You know, it's just, well, the numbers are right. What else can you ask? That, that attitude, if it exists, uh, you know, and I, I get the feeling it does a bit, that's what I worry more about. Well, do you think that's the case? What I mean is there's such a movement right now in all the professions to have ethics education, whether it's medicine, whether it's science, whether it's business, whether it's law. I mean, how effective is ethics education, really? I mean, I'm asking myself as somebody <laughs> who teaches ethics all the time. Uh, well, I think I agree with Dick that it's, that it's somewhat effective, but uh, 
by the time, say, someone is of college age, much yeah. of their character is set. Uh, what I try to get people to do is to be a little more reflective yes. and to be able to uh, have some tools, uh, conceptual tools with which they can think about things a little more clearly. Uh, and But I don't try to change character in a, f <laughs> a few meetings. No. That, that seems to me uh, beyond hope. Yeah, I think uh, you're right. I think, let's say, in our own department of philosophy, uh, we try to have an emphasis on critical thinking, reflection, and so on. And just when, once you get people thinking and uh, enable them to see consequences of actions, mm -hmm. like you were saying, or pros and cons, or trade-offs in value, um, I teach one course on ethics of public policy where the four core values are um, efficiency, equity, security, and freedom. I mean, values which we all kind of treasure or like, but it's the judgment calls about which value should trump which other value in a situation. Sometimes that's what I think is lacking, judgment. And I don't really know how to teach <laughs> judgment or whether it can be taught. I've sort of learned a little bit about judgment through pain, yeah. <laughs> pain and the pleasure principle. Like when I make a bad judgment, uh, there are consequences and so on. Um, you actually teach in a business school, right? Uh, yes, I do. Yeah, so. Um, I teach those horrible things called derivatives. What? <laughs> I was thinking, what? Yeah, derivatives. I mean, how do you find the culture of Loyola University? Uh, well, you know, I, th I, th I think my, I like my students a great yes. deal. Almost all of them are working professionals, yes. most, of them, most of them in the finance industry mm -hmm. in Chicago. Yes. And they come to my classes uh, at night after a full day's work. I, I teach uh, only graduate students these days. Um, I, th I think there's a tendency among people to think that people in business are uh, unethical in a way that others aren't. And I, I think that's absolutely wrong. I, I've uh, had the chance to work in academics a lot. I've had the chance to meet a lot of business people. Uh, I'd have to uh, give the nod to business people over academics uh, as being ethical, uh, although there's perhaps no real difference. And I think that's a point that's important, and that is that uh, there's an enduring human nature. Mm -hmm. uh, there's good people and bad people. That distribution doesn't change over time. Uh, but one of the things that really matters in terms of what, how people actually behave are the kinds of incentives that we give to them. Let's talk mm -hmm. about that. I think that's, and I think that's a, a giant story in the credit crisis is that uh, things were structured in a very, very bad way that gave people extremely strong financial incentives to misbehave. And one of the things that's uh, captured the public imagination are these executive uh, contracts mm -hmm. that are being paid off or we're debating how they should be handled. And uh, in many cases, the compensation was structured in a, such a way that people would maximize their compensation by doing the wrong things. Mm -hmm. A very quick example. Uh, many banks uh, wanted to increase their mortgage business. And so they compensated uh, their people based on the dollar value of the mortgages that were closed. The quantity. The quantity, the dollar quantity. Well, if that's the entire compensation structure, uh, aren't you just telling people you don't need to worry about the quality or whether, whether the loans are good? You're telling them to go forth and make a lot of loans and you'll be yeah. rewarded for that. You know, just as a small example, um, my son was working um, in that type of a, of a endeavor and he really couldn't do it. He quit because um, there was so much pressure on him to s get mortgages sold to people he knew couldn't afford them, really. And you know, to pre he was supposed to present these deals as very favorable to them, and all this kind of thing. And in this, and the oh, the money he could make doing it was incredible, you know, for for a kid. But finally, he just kind of broke down, and he said, "I quit. I can't do it." He said, "Because I know that that woman at the end, you know, that single mom at the end of the phone, you know, what she's going to do a year from now when she can't meet the payments when the balloon uh, comes through." And um, I guess at that point, I thought, for all the trouble he gave me and all the messes, that made me happy that he would quit. But it's really hard to do that, you know. And, you know, I wonder to myself, you know, would I have had the guts to quit? Right. <laughs> you know, with that kind of incentive, I don't know. I, 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 you know, my sense, and certainly I don't know, Bob does, yeah. has been that the, the incentive structure is probably 
the smoking gun or one of the main smoking guns. I'm just wondering how how it got set up that way. How did somebody set up uh, an incentive system that's, you know, if it works right, is going to produce evil? <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, uh, there, there are two answers. One, carelessness and thoughtlessness. Uh -huh. Yes. That's and a the good other one. is uh, malevolence. Oh, well. uh, for instance, if you tell a CEO you're going to be re rewarded on how the stock price does, you're telling the CEO to make the stock price go up. Go up. Yeah. Now, hopefully, they're going to make the stock price go up by running a good business. Right. But you can also make the stock price go up by mm -hmm. lying about your profits. And yes. we've seen over the years yes. uh, both methods. Yeah. Uh, and so I think you need to really attend to, to the kind of incentives that you're giving and to realize it's not so easy to give incentives that elicit the right behavior. Mm -hmm. If you have mm -hmm. children, you think about offering your children incentives or, and the way in which they respond to that, they'll respond differently if you right. have more than one and they'll respond in ways that are totally unpredictable I as totally well. agree with you. So I think that's what children teach one. You know? It's not so easy to give incentives no. that, that you really want to, uh, right. to, to elicit the right behavior. Well, I think we have a very short one minute, and we usually give our guests from the outside world, uh, so Jake, you're out, out <laughs> of luck, uh, a chance to say a final word, and uh, maybe to kind of tie it in with uh, why you came to the ethics and business ethics and credit crisis conference uh, and why you were motivated. Well, uh, I've been studying. What the incentive was, <laughs> yeah. Uh, I've been studying this uh, yeah. crisis a great deal. I've, I do research in that area and I'm also writing a book uh, on uh, particularly incentives in the uh -huh. financial crisis. And in my view, if you look at all the different actors from regulators to prospective homeowners to people who push the mortgages to CEO of financial companies, you can't understand why this happened or how it happened unless you understand the incentives to which they were responding. And it, I think it's extremely complicated uh, and the public, if, they, if the public wants to understand it, they have to invest a good bit of effort in trying to do that. Yeah, so we appreciate your coming and to help us better understand uh, our mess that we're in. I hope we're going to get out of it. What's your prediction? You have about 10 seconds to tell us. Are we going to get out of this? Yes. When? Later. Later. <laughs> okay, you sound I, just like the people on uh, the Actually, I think, we, I think uh, things are getting better already. I think the financial markets have turned, and I think there'll be more pain in the real economy in terms of the employment rate, but I think that will improve soon too. Okay, well that's a good note to end on and we're glad you're here for this conference. Thanks, Dick. Thank you.